Okay, so um, as you can see from the schedule of the program, um, our last activity before we close and head over to the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama, which is, I might as well tell you now and I'll tell you again later, you go out the front door of Butte, so that you leave this building, you turn left, you turn left again and you see it across the road and it's a lovely building and it's got written in lovely letters, the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama. And we go there and it, it'll be lovely. Nothing will go wrong. Um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll reiterate that uh, later. You've got a little map as well of it in, in your handbook. So, so this final um, section is called Communicating Embodied Knowledge. Uh, and I've said it's workshops and a round table debate. The idea behind this was essentially simple, or at least I thought it would be simple uh, when I first thought about it. It was this. I would ask people to think about the passage from Louis Guacond that I've been sharing uh, for a while with you. Um, and it's in the conference handbooks and it's on the screen there. Um, in terms of both the overarching problem that Wacon is posing and in terms of the many huge differences between different kinds of martial arts activities, practices, skills and experiences. So, just to go through this, Wacon puts it like this. How to go from the gut to the intellect, from the comprehension of the flesh to the knowledge of the text. Here is a real problem of concrete epistemology about which we have not sufficiently reflected and which for a long time seemed to me irresolvable. To restitute the carnal dimension of ordinary existence and the bodily anchoring of the practical knowledge constitutive of pugilism, but also of every practice, even the least bodily in appearance, requires indeed a complete overhaul of our way of writing social science. Um, I've always liked this passage. It, it struck me as a really rich passage, and it included the kinds of questions that bothered me for quite a long time. Is it possible to translate physical embodied experience into words? How? Our embodied experience in our world seem to be in quite a fraught relationship when it comes to things like this. And anyway, which kinds of words are most apt to the task? It's questions like that. But then a more specific kind of question formed in my mind. Why can't concerns himself with boxing? And he tries to convey the experience of learning boxing in academic language. But surely, I thought, learning boxing compared to, say, learning Tai Chi Chuan, both are very physical experiences, but surely they're also so different that they would require very different kinds of words and concepts and metaphors. So wouldn't it be great to explore what these linguistic and conceptual differences could or should be? Why do they arise? What might they signify? And I thought, who better to ask to think about this than the people who come to this conference? Because um, we all have our different experiences, we've got our different academic approaches, and, but, but we, share, we seem to share something. So in my head, it seemed simple. Pose this question from Wacon and then point out the differences in the experience of practicing a pugilistic art like boxing, compared with arts that include jumping, spinning, and kicking like taekwondo, compared with grappling arts like wrestling, judo, or Brazilian jiu-jitsu, compared with weapons-based arts, compared with internal martial arts, and so on. So I thought we might form a few different groups, like a pugilistic group, a grappling group, a weapons-based group, an internal martial arts group, and that we'd each go off into our separate rooms and then come back and discuss which terms, concepts, analogies, tropes, metaphors, and so on, seem most appropriate for communicating specific kinds of embodied knowledge. This would be the exercise, and the results would be fascinating and illuminating because of their many differences. However, um, when I posed um, this problematic and proposed these categories to some of my learned colleagues, just some of them, I found that things were not going to be quite so simple. Some people I spoke to suggested that this line of thought was ultimately going to take us nowhere. Others suggested that it's already been hugely developed in places that none of us seem to have looked. Others came at the matter with precise approaches and methodologies in mind. <coughs> Others attacked the categories I had proposed. 
suggesting that distinctions like grappling versus pugilistic versus weapons versus internal were so deeply problematic that they should be rejected at the outset. Um, uh, <laughs> if you've ever used these categories, you're wrong, apparently. According to six. Consequently, before we even begin, things do not appear to be turning out quite the way that I had anticipated. Uh, but I think that this is definitely a good thing. Um, for despite the initial state of disagreement and dissensus, several colleagues have still agreed to join me up here and give a brief statement about their takes on the problems being posed. So now the idea is that after I finish this introduction, my colleagues will each propose a way of conceptualizing and engaging with the issues raised. We'll then have some time for discussion in this group here and now. Uh, and after that, we'll have another short break. I think there'll be tea and coffee there as well. But while we're talking, you should choose um, the person that most interested you or annoyed you or that you would want to go and continue that conversation with um, and go with them to... W I'll, give, I'll give each of our speakers one of these rooms and, and, and then you can follow them after the break to the, that room. Um, so then you go off to the rooms for the, an hour and a half. That's the t allocated time, same length as a normal panel. And then we'll have, again, another break, because we'll be exhausted. And then we'll reconvene here and go, th go through it all. Our, our, the, the panel leaders will be our spokespeople, but it should be we'll get everyone involved in the conversation. Um, so concluding discussion, that'll be half five till about half six. And then we'll take it outside uh, and across the street. <laughs> 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 and then we'll take it outside and see, see which categories. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, um, and then we go to the Royal Welsh College um, for our closing reception, which I am currently very much looking forward to. So I'm, it's, then things have changed slightly. I'm joined in this endeavour by uh, Dr. Daniel Jacquet from the University of Geneva, who um, during his wonderful keynote here last year was truly our knight in shining armour. Um, and Daniel is very well known the world over for his fascinating work on, in, around historical European martial arts. Uh, we're also, I'll be joined by uh, Sixt Betzler, who we already met public um, and who we all know and love. Um, disappointingly, um, Ben Judkins was going was gonna to lead a group because uh, he kind of agreed with my categories. He kind of was like, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. I'll, I'll do the, 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 the different categories that you've proposed. Um, but he's just looked at the, and he doesn't trust the British transport system, and so he ha they have to get to Gatwick, so, which is sensible, you know. British trains are just a disaster. Um, so I will have to lead a, a panel as well, but I'm, I might, what I might do is give someone the, I might promote someone, so that, so that for the final discussion I can just be like the chair rather than advocate anything in particular. And finally, Dr. Eric Burkhart, um, who's also a regular at these conferences, who was a postdoctoral researcher and lecturer in medieval history at the University of Trier. Um, so I'll, I'll hand over to Daniel first, who's going to speak for a few minutes. Thank you. There it is. <clears throat> okay, my, my own opinion about the issue uh, addressed by Paul relies on my research on the so-called fight books in early modern Europe. They represent a very interesting source material to wrestle with uh, regarding this issue of translation of embodied martial knowledge embedded into specific historical cultural context. Actually, it allows us to turn out, uh, to turn inside out, vacant quote. So we would go facing these fight books from a scholarly uh, perspective, from the intellectual to the guts. Um, these fight books are often wrongly considered as fighting manuals. They are not. Well, that is to say that they follow a, a didact didactic intent of transmitting embodied martial knowledge to third parties. If this is true for some, it's not true for most. I found most useful not to try to break down my source material into different fighting disciplines in order to analyze them, but I sorted them out by authorial intents. Uh, following scholars of dance studies or those who focused on notation of movement through history. So these are the categories there. Uh, I believe that this way we may wrestle with Vacant's problem, as seen by Paul, with another perspective. That is, whatever period 
type of media of what Pauls call uh, performative elaboration uh, in his forthcoming chapter, uh, trying to understand what's the intention of the author and the communication strategy chosen to write down his embodied know-how. Out of this, we can see emerging different type of meaningful strategies using specific group of words or images, tropos, metaphors, codes, and so on. We could then try to connect these communicative bricks to specific communities of practices embedded into their own social cultural context. Let me shortly uh, exemplify those categories. So if you can read the quote above. This is an example of uh, codification. So it's basically a translation from an oral tra uh, tradition to a written tradition. And you cannot understand this. While people are trying to do this, so the quote below is someone who is trying to interpret, that, interpret this text, but you can see this is rich, right? So this is one form of uh, transmitting, attempt of transmitting embodied knowledge. Um, here's another. And it's, uh, so it's labeled at the top, the French wrestling, but it doesn't explain to you what's the initial position, what's the end position, what's the technique, we don't know. It's just depicted like this. So it's an attempt to depict, to represent a technique. And the last one would be an attempt on explaining techniques. On this example, there are two. One is copied from the other, and here's the text. And there is no specific wording here, or codes, or whatever. They're really trying to make it out to actually describe what they see. So this, is, this might be the, um, an example where you, we, we may face a didactic intent. However, we have to try to go through it. So I would like my group to think about this categories within their own uh, martial experience and research and source material. So basically, uh, if we have time, why I put two of those quotes? Because, because this is because I think that the original intent on the left has been corrupted on the right during the translation process. So let's say if you only study this, you will have something that is wrong compared to the authorial intent. So the processes of corruption is as well, as well very, very interesting. So my group will look into identifying the authorial intention with these three categories and then analyzing the performative elaboration, that is the medium and the discourse, in order to translate the embodied knowledge to whatever media or written or depiction, and the potential corruption of the authorial intention through the translation process. Thank you very much. Um, what I want to do is, I want to start at the very beginning um, with all of this. I think that the, the problem we are facing at the moment, um, no, here in this room and in this session, um, this is one of the fundamental, fundamental problems um, of martial arts studies. And um, it is, as you said, I think we're not the first ones who thought over similar, about similar problem, uh, problems. I guess in dance studies you would have very similar, similar um, things. Um, but nevertheless, we should make up our own minds, of course, and we cannot just copy what others did before us. Um, and we should, we should first, I think, try to clarify our questions. Yeah. Because this is, a, this is a, like, everybody reads that and everybody goes like, yeah, okay, and that's important to go from the guts to the intellect. So what is the guts? What is the intellect? Where does the distinction come from at the very beginning? Yeah. So why is there, why, this, is, this is an assumption already that you have a, you have a clear intellect that can uh, explain, probably explain what the body is doing, but the body has a, has a feeling, has an emotion that is separate from the, from the intellect at the very first stage, um, then what are, your, what are your physical feelings? What, where do, do you, do you, does your body knowledge come from? Is it really your body knowledge? Or is it the body knowledge that when you are asked what is your body doing, that you are referring to because you have been told to use these vocabularies in the style yet who you have been doing. So are you indeed, are you indeed referring to what your body is feeling or are you referring to what you have been told that your body should be feeling at this moment?
Yeah. So there's, I think that is so highly, it's so super problematic that we cannot just go and say like, yeah, now we have to, we have to develop a, a method. First, we have to clarify the question, I think, and uh, the things that we are dealing with here. Yeah. We, have to, we have to go a step back because this is so complicated. Um, and um, what, I'm, what I'm then also, want, what I also want to address, and you wrote it in some of your emails, I don't know if it's in the text, in the program, um, is the question, and this has been coming up over the last days and also especially in the last uh, session that I just chaired, um, a question that comes up again and again, do we have to be able to do martial arts, do we have to be martial artists, do we have to have training in martial arts to be able to do martial arts studies? Yeah. And my position on this is adamant, absolutely 100% no. Yeah. Absolutely not. Yeah. For several reasons. Yeah. The first reason, I think, is that, um, again, the, the terms are unclear. Yeah. We have to, you have to do martial arts to become a martial arts study, because otherwise you don't understand what, you, what you're talking about in martial arts studies. So what does it mean you're doing martial arts? Yeah. So d do I have to have like 20 years of karate in my background to be able to do martial arts studies? Is one year enough of karate probably? Is it okay if I did a, did a self-defense course? Yeah. No, one self-defense course is not enough, but one year of, of karate. Yeah, but I did karate only with kata. Yeah, it's still okay, I think. Uh, okay, I didn't, do, I didn't do karate, but I did taibo. It's, it's also a little bit, yeah, okay, that's, that's, still, that's still okay. Uh, I didn't taibo, but I did gymnastics. Uh, no, sorry, you cannot do martial arts studies. So this is, this is, this is weird. And, and I think that's even worse, um, it assumes an essence of martial arts. There's an essentialism uh, and underlying, because um, you have to be able to do martial arts. Yeah? Uh, you have to be a martial artist to be able to do martial arts studies would mean that all the martial arts basically are the same. Yeah? There is something, because I am from Pekete Tirsha, so I can speak about your Choilifat because we are both martial artists. No, why? Why on earth? Yeah? That would assume that there is an essence, one core that makes all these things, all these arts that we are, are over which we throw this umbrella term martial arts, that they are basically all the same. Yeah? And because you're doing one of this myriad of different versions of things that we call martial arts, yeah? or as Eric pointed out, never ever called martial arts, but we call them martial arts nowadays, that we are in the position to speak about that. And I think that simply doesn't work. And then, what, which, is, which is much more important, I think, uh, no, not much more important, but is, is what is just as important, but coming from another side. Ben had this fantastic talk yesterday about how we can integrate within academic communities on a larger scale. Yeah. So, hello, Mr. Dean. We want to start a martial arts studies uh, institute here at the university. What do you think about that? Oh, that's awesome. Can you explain to me? Not really, because you're not, you're not doing Wing Chun, sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's like, this ridiculous. This is, this is ridiculous. We're shooting ourselves on our own foot from the very outset. From the very outset. And the, the, I think the problem that I'm facing here, I'm, I'm always looking at martial arts studies from my academic background, with it, which is religious studies or history of religion. And many of the discussions that are going on here, so many of the discussions we had in religious studies 100 years ago. Yeah? And then again, seven, uh, 30 years or 40 years ago, when, when f um, re uh, phenomenology of religion was such a big item. Yeah? Because there exactly was exactly the same discussion. Do you have to be a religious person? Do you have to have a feeling for God to be able to do religious studies? Yeah? And there were different lines in this. And you know, people like Eliade, probably Mircea Eliade, people like those who said, yeah, there is something holy and the, the human being on every culture reacts to the holy or the sacred or God or whatever. And to be able to understand religion, you have to be able to have a feeling for God, because otherwise it wouldn't work. Yeah, and then there's another branch of, of religious studies, to which I belong, um, says, no, not at all. This has nothing to do. What you're doing is theology, which might have a place. Yeah? But this is not what we are doing here, because we want, to, we want to develop a system to look at religions that everybody can understand and that we can explain to everyone. And I think for martial arts studies, the, the aim should be the same. We want to develop a system to describe, understand, explain, look at martial arts yeah, that, that we can explain to everyone uh, who is willing to listen to us. Yeah. And uh, being a martial artist cannot be a prerequisite, I think. Yeah. So what I want to do is in my sh workshop is um, a little experiment. We will move a bit in my workshop. I will give. I will go to this to this first notion of how and if 
movements from different systems are comparable, how do we speak about movements, how do we speak what our body feels with that. Um, so I will, I will show a, a movement pattern from my system that I train and teach, and then um, without explaining what it is. Yeah. And then I want to see if probably you're from coming from your different backgrounds, everyone in the room is a martial artist, coming from your backgrounds will have similar movement patterns or will think that they have similar movement patterns because probably they're the same, probably are not. Ultimately, I said that before, I think that this will lead us nowhere, <laughs> <laughs> but at least we can try. So this is the idea. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, maybe Paul, you choose the wrong kind of people to, to address this, uh, this workshop because I'm also not going to, to go into grappling or to these different uh, things. I would like to uh, address something which is quite similar to both accounts because we three are working very closely together, so um, not much of a surprise here. But what I would like to address is a problem which is most relevant for all of us maybe dealing with martial arts of the past. So. Um, one, one important factor of martial arts is movement and um, the technique that structures these movements. And um, if we follow the account of Ben Spatz in his uh, book from 2015, uh, What a Body Can Do, Technique as Knowledge, um, Practice as Research, we can distinguish between um, concrete instances of practice and the technique that structures these instances of practice. So, Technique in the account of spats then has to be addressed as a form of knowledge um, that spreads from body to body, which is, uh, well, s looking at technique somehow, well, it reminded me of um, looking at the virus. It's, it's, uh, you can not really separate the virus from the host. Um, so if we think of, of technique as some sort of virus, um, it, it's, well, it spreads from body to body, but it's also constantly mutating because always um, if it encounters a new body, it, it changes slightly if it's adapt adopted. So I think this observation should prevent us from any form of es essentialism related to styles, martial arts, and uh, martial arts practice. Um, because the karate practiced, for example, in a specific dojo is neither the same karate which is practiced in the dojo next door, nor is it the same karate that was practiced in those dojos five years ago. So practice is changing and practice is changing when it's transmitted. If we thus accept the, that practice and uh, technique are constantly changing, um, then that what we could call styles has no fixed uh, solid core which could be transmitted over the centuries. Um, then if we look at it from a, from a historical perspective or from a, from a martial arts studies perspective that wants to, uh, well, to, to address something which is not the martial arts of the present but well, dating five years back, tw 10 years back, 20 years back, um, then we can't just assume that those styles, those schools haven't changed. Um, we have thus the, the problem that um, this problem is imminent if we're dealing with Tai Chi practice of the 19th century but it's even more um, difficult if we're dealing with uh, sword fighting styles from the 15th century. So we then if we want to make uh, any sort of uh, well, uh, observation on these forms of movement, then we have to address documents that we have to interpret as um, records of movement or as records of technique. Um, so we're entering uh, some sort of hermeneutic circle um, and the, the stage is set from our own embodiment, our own embodied experience sets the stage for interpreting anything, uh, any record of movement, which Daniel already showed, as something more than just a symbol. Uh, and what I would like to address is um, this question of the hermeneutic circle, and you could, we could call it hermeneutics of movement. So can, is there a way to, uh, well, to conclude from symbols referring to practice, referring to technique, to the actual practice? Um, and I think this could be interesting for people working on, well, stuff which is um, not our martial arts that we can observe, that we can, uh, well, do ethnography. Um, so, but everything that which has to relate on documents. This is the question I would like to, um, to discuss in this workshop. And I, I have some, um, well, some examples from different, um, different areas and different times. Um, and maybe you have also material that you would like to discuss and I would come to um, well, to, to a discussion on 
how does your prior training, your knowledge, the knowledge of your body, um, enable you to understand these symbols as representations for movement and technique, basically. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so I, uh, Ben was going to defend my initial idea, but he's left me. So, um, I, I think w if I have to lead a session, um, it would literally be, you know, are we talking about the same thing? I mean, m based on my range of experiences, the Tai Chi is a very, very different thing to a screamer. Uh, the, the training is, is so, you know. Uh, or, or if you think about the difference between like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu uh, and uh, Taekwondo, the styles of sparring, the styles of training, the, the types of practice there, we can say they're martial arts, but, but what terms and concepts are best used to convey um, what is going on there? So I want to keep it quite, you know, pre-critical pre categories. The categories that we use easily and that, that exist in the world, um, uh, there are the grappling arts, there are pugilistic arts, there are, um, there are weapons-based arts. Um, so that's, that, would be my, um, that, that would be my group. Um, does anyone want to respond at this stage to any of us, any of these points? Does anyone want to answer this question? <laughs> yeah? So he, hearing a sixth pre presentation, the first part, uh, I, I said to myself, okay, I'm, I'm going with you. And then, and then you say that, um, how, how do I turn that? Um, um, so you say that we, if martial arts studies has to be made uh, by martial artists, it's wrong. But, but then you propose um, to, for your workshop that everybody is coming with like you show uh, technique, and then somebody has to show his own technique. If I'm not a martial artist, what can I? How do I? How do I participate in your workshop? You, you can you can just write it. As I said, the end of the workshop should be okay. That doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> ah yeah yeah yeah. So but uh, like I I made my mind. Uh, so I will come with you, but. But it's just like it's like you 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 uh, your premise. It's really good, uh, and and then but if if it comes to the to showing techniques, but but I will come with you. Yeah, I, I, I want to I want to do this with the techniques to prove that it makes no sense. Okay, okay, <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. I can tell this before. I mean, we could also make it like a joke, and at the end, I'm like, ha ha. Yeah, okay. But, uh, I'm honest with you, so I want to do this to, to to show that it doesn't work. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. And I want to do it also so that we move a bit because it's fun to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So it works in terms of having fun, then, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> now, the, the, there's, there's another set of questions which are related um, t to my initial interest in this kind of thing, which is, you know, why do we fixate on the written word? Why do we still fixate on writing? Why don't we video everything, right? Why don't we video it? And then, you know, why don't we do... A, wh wh why, as academics, are we still so completely and utterly stuck on the written word when we've got YouTube? Um, and when we've got all sorts of things. So like, so Ben Spatz, who was here last year, he's setting up the Journal of Embodied Research. And his argument, it, 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 the premise of the journal is that the, the best way to um, communicate stuff about embodiment, stuff about movement, stuff about l transmitting skill and technique um, is to use audiovisual technology to, to mark it up, to kind of point, say, little, little sub-captions, this guy's doing this, and look, notice the footwork here, and the breath is like this. And, and so, and that can, that can far exceed the, the uh, uh, 6,000 word essay on, you know, 6,000 word essay on how to do Tai Chi, it's like, mm. But you know, you could grasp, you could grasp more from, from seeing someone go and explain, ex explain something. So we could, we could broach that question as well. I mean, so this is Wacon really using some problematic binaries between guts, which is, which is a metaphor. You know, it's, it's not about your guts, is it? And it, he's chosen that metaphor because, because it works for him. It works really well. If I say guts, that means it means something earthy and strong and, and, and I can oppose that to the intellect. So I've got this mind-body thing going on. But by intellect, he, does, he means when we, how do we write this down? He's talking about thick description. He's talking about... So, but why? I mean, do we still need to, to worry about this? Why don't we just video everything? Have workshops and video, yeah. 
There is a professor at, I think, City U in uh, Hong Kong who is recognizing the fact that the uh, richness of Chinese Kung Fu traditions are dying out. Uh, certain schools like Wing Chun and Hong Gar will always be popular, but the more esoteric ones do not have students who can reach the level of training to become the next generation master. So what he has decided to do is have these old masters come in to a motion capture studio and perform their routines and then capture it for posterity. So anyone, I, I guess this would be the closest thing to the Matrix where Neo has that download of uh, X amount of uh, fighting styles, right? But that is one way because as we know, the uh, photo sequence of this to this to this to this never works because it's the movement in between the pictures that is so important to learning the technique. But this is one way to use available technology to try to uh, at least create a database through which an ana analysis could be undertaken. Um, the question of why we are so fixated on scripture or words or even pictures um, appeared in my um, topic uh, because I asked myself uh, what's the difference between a skateboarder who would reject uh, the idea of going to a teacher or paying someone or paying uh, or buying something to, to learn his, I call it art, um, to a martial artist who has ingrained this idea of a, a sensei or a teacher to someone who he can go to. So I think that's a cultural difference where you come from, what your ideas are, and um, yeah. So in, in terms of that relationship between the sort of the text and the bodily practice and the intellect and the guts, I think it, when I'm looking at it, I'm also thinking it's kind of the classical problem of 18th century European aesthetics, that there's the feeling like beauty to the sublime. And in a way, the passage from feeling to writing to words involves a relationship to, um, to the community, to the census communist, to the idea that even though aesthetic experience is subjective, if you make a, an aesthetic judgment, that's beautiful you're actually placing that in a realm of debate and discourse that other people can then challenge, talk about. Um, and that, you know, certainly within the sort of European philosophical tradition, it's within language as a site of discourse that that comparison, that sharing of feeling can actually happen. So I don't know whether we accept that is true or not, that actually words are what makes things shareable, but that would sort of seem to be the premise which Wacom is actually still coming from in a series of ways. So that kind of mind-body dualism <coughs> is kind of, it's kind of within that intellectual tradition that he's writing within. That, that would just be my sort of observation about that, that idea of the passage and why it might be problematic. And, but then if we don't go with the idea that it's text, that it's words, which are the supposedly rational intellectual thing that makes things shareable amongst us as rational beings, which is kind of in a sense what academic discourse is based upon, then what does become the basis of that shared discussion or experience, what does become the medium for that um, in a way that works so that we're not all just looking at each other's styles through you know, kind of completely, you know, I'm, I'm looking at your hungar through my Tai Chi idea, eyes and thinking it's the same, but it's not, and we can't ever really sort of meet and work out what the differences and similarities are. Just uh, would like to uh, address the video question. Um, it's a document as well, and uh, capturing in motion capture, it's exactly, if we rely to these categories, it's inscription in 500 years. People that will look at those files, okay, in a better technology that we have from the 15th century, there will be this questionable if they can access to the actual knowledge. And uh, it's interesting because how you will mediate this knowledge would depend on the authorial intent. If it's just inscription, 
you can do nothing about this. If it's an attempt on description, maybe we can find a way, but uh, Six would argue it's not possible. I would argue that it is closely to possible. So I don't know. But, uh, okay, it's the same. Like promotional video could also be uh, used for, uh, as a document for research. And also vi instructional videos where people have the intention to actually be didactic. However, they use codes that may refer to a selected few. I don't know. This is also, okay. okay. Uh, thanks. I, I have a slightly downer thing to say. You know, it's not my mode, but like everyone has to have one downer moment. Um, I, d I really hate this quote. There's an aspect to Wacom I cannot bear. I just want to get into that text and say, you twerp. Like, <laughs> get a life, read, read. Your problem, it, it isn't just religious studies that, you know, posed various questions 100 years ago. He's, he's reinventing as, like, stunning revelations, things that great French uh, social theorists like Lefebvre and de Certeau, Lefebvre rested his entire history and theory of the problem of everyday life on precisely, you know, a detailed explanation exploration of the relationship between the oral word and the written word, which is, I think, Luke, something we, we blur over when we talk about the word, um, because Paul was asking us about the written word. But to me, there's a, his a, a particular historically irritating dimension to this type of formulation, which is something you read quite often in martial arts studies, that uh, the body is a subaltern object in the West and, and the, the bodily anchoring also of every practice, not just pugilism, is, is this thing that we have to overhaul. Fine, if you have been ignoring 40 years worth of feminist philosophy, which is about precisely this problem, and indeed to go back even further, reflection on racialization <laughs> and race experience, let's read... W. B. Du Bois and the souls of black folk in relation to this type of problem, the carnal dimension of ordinary existence and how you take that up to the level of philosophising. So to get off my soapbox, I would say that, you know, to me the interesting question would be to rewrite that last sentence with a video camera or in writing, there are many ways to do it, uh, and say that perhaps what we need is a complete overhaul of our way of reading what we're going to take to be the basis of our field of study. You know, why, why don't we include 40 years of feminist philosophy, 100 years of, you know, um, thought about racialisation, uh, in, in the actual base. And I think this is a limit, as you noted yourself in your description, um, of a certain type of social science. But it's really bad when you're French and you're talking as though the people who lived 20 years before you and thought the magnificent problematic framework of how to understand the 20th century when you write as though they didn't exist. It means you're a particular type of professionalised subject um, you, you maybe should be a dean and... Okay, so... <laughs> um, well, I understood Vacan here writing um against Geertz and uh, um I think for for me it made sense uh what Wacon writes here when when we look at um Geertz's uh, description of the Balinese cockfight and he never actually got into doing it himself so I was wondering uh how much better would have been Geertz's description of the Balinese cockfight if he would have been doing it himself so in a way I think yeah it's um I mean, for me, it, it just to bring up this the dimension of doing it um, you yourself and experiencing uh, what's happening there is interesting. And um, I think it's not, so for me, what's interesting is not so much going from the 
guts to the intellectuals, but what you just mentioned, Megan, the, the carnal dimension of ordinary existence. And I mean, the other day I, um, I had a book of political, French political scientists who looked at um, like people in a kiosk uh, selling uh, uh, magazines and so on. And what's their bodily experience of doing that? And how can you connect it then to, to questions that uh, political scientists are interested in? So, um, yeah, so in, in that way, I, I, I found your proposal of, uh, or your question of how can we actually practically write about it so that it's interesting to, to many people. Uh, interesting and I know I thought about it more in a kind of writing workshop or something and we, we share our text with each other and see what works best um, but yeah I also think that when I read your, your proposal um, Paul that um, that I don't see the the big difference between a text and video I think both both in a way are text and both have to be interpreted and both are constructed so um, I think well, they could. It would be interesting to combine them both to have different descriptions of what's going on. Uh, oh yeah, go on then. Yeah, we'll, we'll work with the language. Yeah, I was just going to say there are other visual things that are studied. Like I was just thinking, history of art. That's. It, it's not like everybody has to paint a painting in order to do their history of art degree, is it? So I would have thought, you know, you could maybe look at other degrees and see how th that study visual things like that just to see how they work basically basically that that was just a comment I'll, do call, I'll get it over to you soon it's coming it's coming your way uh i will add my voice to those of you who are rejecting the false dichotomy between mind and body uh you can't have a mind without a body so uh, from that perspective, as soon as you use your mind to become aware of anything, to perceive something, you're always aware of something. You're not just aware unless you've achieved some sort of Buddhist enlightenment. So why do we write? Because our awareness, our internal dialogue is constantly in language. And people go to great lengths in esoteric traditions to be able to shut down the voice in the mind, but I defy anyone in the room to not think a thought in words or language for 20 minutes. It's dreadfully hard. So I think it's pretty natural that we would try and express what we're understanding in language because it's a constant part of our experience. Um, in terms of how to get from the comprehension of the flesh to the knowledge of the text, um, uh, there's a philosopher uh, by the name of Mark Johnson who uh, suggests that the body is in the mind and that, in fact, all of our cognition is, uh, it can be tied down to a lot of physical things. So his big example is force, which works super nicely with martial arts. We understand force from a very young age. We understand gravity. If you drop something, there's a force that pulls it down. If someone pushes you, there's a force, and you feel it, and you'll fall over. But we also understand force in social terms. You understand social pressure. We talk about pressure. Even though it's not a physical force, we understand it through the body. So in a way, it's not quite as much of a problem, maybe, as Wakant is making it out to be, uh, that we somehow need to, to do something different than we're already doing. But maybe the problem more is how do we stop trying to write the body out? How do we avoid making claims to objectivity or styles of writing that make it seem as though we're not doing everything with our body in the first place? And I blame Descartes for this. Um, I tell you what, because um, we're we've got like ten more minutes. So w why don't I take a restatement or a, a or a final words from these guys, and then we'll decide which rooms. I think that might take ten minutes, and then the questions um, we can share them, and, and we'll come back to this. So would would you like anyone like to say anything further at this point? Just one uh, more thing, which uh, I wanted to address. You talked about motion capture. And the problem is what, what I was thinking about last year when I was here and heard the, the keynote of Daniel Rotz 
um, who talked about Taolu and the, the, um, the, well, the meaning of those movements in Taolu, um, those, we ha I think we have to distinguish between martial arts is about force. It's about force between bodies. Uh, it's not a, just about movement in a solo form. It's about the, also about the application of movement. So um, maybe we should also think about movement as a symbol, not just movement as something which is, well, bodily, but the body is a symbol itself. So we can also talk about what, what does this movement in Tai Chi mean if we do it in, in push hands, something like that. So we have an, another layer of semiotic reference if, we, if you're talking about movement and the, re the recording of movement, which is basically just an inscription, as you just said. Yeah. Just another thought. Um, when, when Paul sent around these emails um, a couple of weeks ago, I started to think about this problem again and again. And at the beginning, I had like a, a rough idea what I wanted to do. And um, the more I thought about it, the more it got just yeah, dissolved. Just n nothing that I tried to, to, to develop to get my hands on the problem worked out <laughs> in the end. So um, I, I devised like, okay, there's uh, people in robotics nowadays and they are building robots um, that uh, duplicate the human um, skeletal structure and they make artificial muscles around them. So p to be able to program these robots, of course, they must first have an understanding of how the human body moves. So they must have pretty precise knowledge of the way um, muscles work. So we would need to uh, motion capture the people uh, and then fit them into certain movement patterns, like make out some movement patterns without the, the emotional or intellectual reflection of the, of the practitioners behind that at first, only the bodies, and then ask the practitioners, so what do you feel when you do it, or how do you interpret yourself? Yeah, and then again, as I, as I said before, separate in the practitioners um, what is the language of their style, or the voice of their style, yeah, and what is the voice of themselves, if this is at all possible. And immediately you're like, oh my god, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just think it's incredibly prob problematic. And um, the one, one thing that is important to me in the, in the whole discussion is, as you just said, Colin, um, the, the, the false, probably false dichotomy of the, of the body and the, and the mind. And at the same time in the discussion, very often in martial arts circles, and again, the, the discussions or the discourses of the martial arts circles tend to spill over into our discussions, yeah, because this is where many of us come from, um, is like a reverse Gnosticism, yeah, often. So the intellect, this is evil. This is what what will shade or what will what veil your vision of the true world. But your body is where the truth is, yeah. And now now we find this is really it's it's the uh, Evangelium of of John only the other way around. <laughs> so first there's the flesh and the flesh is good and uh, the flesh made the intellect and this is evil and we have to come. Uh, I don't say that everyone is thinking like this, but there's this undercurrent, I think, in our talking, and we must be very careful of that, I think, and uh, reject it from the outside. Uh, outset. Yeah. Um, <coughs> whatever type of media we are studying, I think it is worth thinking of the, um, the way to analyze them, because it might give information not about the task that is translating embodied knowledge into words, but it will inform us about the social practice, well, the social context, the communities of practice. So if we consider those traces of attempt of translating embodied knowledge, it will inform from a sociology, anthropological or historical perspective on when it was produced. And I think that's the, the key uh, here. But however, in order to do this, to have this attempt, I think we should categorize them first. <laughs>